right. So hi, everyone. Welcome. And uh, welcome to our second Tuesday talks. It's just twos all around tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I am Michael Chervendal. I'm the director of the JKC Gallery, and I'm just here as tech support right now. And I'm going to quickly hand it over to Heather and Habib, who are on Heather's camera. Hey, Heather. Habib, <laughs> uh, and uh, they'll introduce their guests. Um, I do want to make a, a quick announcement. It's, it's a little bit of a, a maybe sad announcement, but uh, it's going to be good. Um, we have a few more Tuesday talks coming up. Uh, the show on the walls here is actually going to be the last show for a while. Uh, I have, a, um, as you many of you know, I run the photo program at Mercer, and I have a lot of other things I need to attend to. And we need to just sort of figure out some things here at the gallery as well. Uh, I am hoping to be back next September. Uh, so uh, please come to this show, uh, these Tuesday talks and Ara show and uh, say hello and uh, bye for a while. But uh, anyway, let me hand it over to Heather and Habib. Hi, everyone. Hello. As always, thank you for being here. Um, we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd tonight, um, both in person and on Zoom. We appreciate you being here every month. Uh, we have a really great show for you today with both David, Timothy, and Phoenix Robles. Um, I'm going to introduce the show, and then I'll pass it over to Habib. For anyone that may be attending for the very first time, uh, Tuesday Talks is a monthly event, an hour-long artist talk, um, in which two artists share their work. Um, we, Habib and I, started this event uh, in 2020 as a way to bring the photography community here in Trenton together. Um, and, <laughs> hi. Phoenix just arrived, so I'm a little distracted. <laughs> see you. Um, so since we've uh, started this event to bring everyone together, we are very happy to have you each here um, each and every month. And then Habib, would you like to introduce our two artists tonight? Yes, yes. Just to follow up with Heather, we want to thank everyone in attendance virtually and definitely in person. Tonight, we have two, two special guests. We have David Timothy, I met David a couple of years ago. I want to say that he's working out of Trent, New Jersey. He's a great, great portrait photographer. And I've seen his work just elevate. He's going to have some things to show you. And we also have Phoenix Rose. And she's an awesome street photographer. Um, I met her in person a while ago. And her work continues to inspire me. And she has some things she wants to show also. So without further ado, we want to start with David tonight. All right. David will go first. Um, during his presentation, please feel free to leave comments and questions in the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. Awesome. I'm on. Yep. Okay. So before I start showing uh, some of my images, what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of background and uh, talk a little bit about the body of work that I'm going to show you. This is a body of work that I've been working on probably since I've been 10 years old. And what you need to know is that I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. And in the South, on some of the rural roads, you would drive down and there might be a Pentecostal church. And then five miles down, there's a Lutheran church. And five miles down, there's a Southern Baptist church. And it just goes on and on. And so as I would be in the car as a passenger, as my parents were driving, um, somehow I knew at 10 years old that organized religion was not for me and that I didn't belong within organized religion. And in between those churches are buildings and they would say auto, um, body repair. And then it would be a uh, body shop. And I didn't know it as a 10 year old uh, that it was for automobiles. I thought it was for human beings and their bodies. And I remember distinctly thinking that when I get old enough and when no one will know, I'm gonna go to a body shop and I'm gonna have my body fixed and corrected. And so I found myself, I didn't know that I was gay as a 10 year old person, but as a balding old photographer now, I do know that I'm gay. And I find myself really attracted to
problem with oh, audio. Oh, so, oh. <laughs> so for, did everybody lose it or some people? Nope. Everybody we're lost good. it. We're back. We're okay. Back. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm going to recap really, really quickly for those that that uh, may have lost the audio because it's important in terms of the body of work. As a ten year old, I did not know that I was gay. As an old balding photographer, I do know that I am gay. My husband is in the audience. Um, and that I'm attracted to people who have congruency or with their bodies and their sensuality, their gender, and their sexuality. And so this first image is a, uh, an image of Ganesh. It's a ring that I wear almost daily. Ganesh is uh, a Hindu god of overcoming obstacles. This model was fantastic. And when you think about spirituality and breath, those two are intertwined. And so I asked the model if he would bite my ring and exhale. And uh, he said, absolutely. So this is sort of the beginning of religious sensuality and spirituality coming together. In the Philippines, there's a town in San Fernando, Pampanga, that during Holy Week, uh, they, there's a procession that walks the, the 14 stations of the cross, and they flagellate themselves. And here, this idea of representation religion through blood is the, uh, I can't think of what the word is I want. It, it's the demonstration of their commitment and their bodily uh, pain in serving their religious beliefs. For those that are uh, really uh, uh, want to continue their penance, at the end of this, there are some that will get nailed to the cross. They have nails that will pierce the hands and they will pierce both feet. Uh, and when they're nailed to the cross, uh, they make a commitment that they're gonna do this for two years, four years, six years, however long they wanna make it. And the cross is hoisted up and they stay there until they say tamana, tamana, which is enough, enough, bring me down. And they're brought down and the, the nails that have pierced their skins have been removed. And then they go off to a, a tent and just kind of recoup where they are. This is a composite. It, I was in a, an abandoned church. This was in the basement. And the moment I saw the, the walls, I knew that this was going to be something that I would create because it reminded me so much of the skin on the backs from the flagellations. And the whip that she's using is the same whip that they use in San Fernando Pampanga when they flagellate themselves. And this was a, a, a willing model who you'll see a little bit uh, later. Again, this idea, and the, the title of this is The Price of Admission. It's really trying to connect what we do to our bodies so that it's congruent with our spiritual faith. And in this case, it's self-mortification. I want to switch a little bit to sensuality. Um, and Nadine was probably my first nude model. Uh, and I had asked uh, her to pick up a screen and exhale. And as she did, the screen caught this shadow self. And if you're familiar with Carl Jung's the shadow self, it's almost as if you know her shadow escaped as she was exhaling and imprinted itself on the screen. This is the same model Nadine wearing a chain, uh, a chain mail, and really trying to go from the shadow self escaping and being imprinted to perhaps being imprisoned in some form of clothing, waiting by a window or trying to escape. How long has she been there? How long is she going to stay there? What is she trying to escape from? What is she waiting for? I don't know. And this was really her true nature, where at one point after the being imprisoned in the chain mail, she says, let's go outside. And so she goes outside and she's running around just communing with nature. And uh, that expression really captures her spirit. And again, in terms of the theme of this congruency, uh, her sensuality, her identity, and then uh, sort of communing with nature was consistent with how she views herself. 
So this is a river and river identifies as fluid as does his boyfriend who you'll see it in a, in a little bit, but they stilettos, fishnets, uh, makeup is very much how they uh, dress in, in their personal life. And we were doing a couple of shots. And at one point I just said, oh, just be yourself. And then everything came alive in terms of how they were posing and the way they were expressing themselves. Again, this is a river. I call this the Kit Kat Club. And in addition to the clothing and the makeup, um, I asked them if they would be willing to kiss on camera. And the room just electrified. And part of that was because I think this idea of behavior and what behaviors, what do we do in addition to what we wear in terms of makeup or clothing, the behavior that we're able to demonstrate and to, able, be, to be able to demonstrate that freely. I'm gonna shift a little bit to from behavior into this idea of makeup or painting. Um, this is Danielle and Danielle is this amazing human being. And he arrived in a Chinese collar dress, Mandarin uh, dress. He was late and he goes, oh, let me get ready. And so this was him getting ready and he was just painting his face uh, for the shoot. And we're doing a number of, of shots and he stops and he goes, David, I wanna sing for you. I said, okay. And so he sings and he's got this incredible voice and he paints and he sketches and he sings. And so I, I said, Daniel, what is your major form of uh, art? I swear this is true. And he goes, David, I am my form of art. Again, this idea of consistency and congruency. In stark contrast to Daniel is Michael. Michael is straight. Um, this was also an, a nude uh, shot and we were talking about sensuality and sexuality and uh, how he, and the question was, you know, how do you represent it? And so as we began to look at, at different poses, obviously the intensity, the intensity of his eyes, very masculine, uh, it just conveys, this is called the desiring, whether people are desiring him or he's desiring others is up to you. But the conversation also took another turn when we started to talk about being constricted or tied up, saying this is the same model. Now, which is his true identity and his true congruence? I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna leave that up to you. Was it the first image? Is it this image? Up to you. I'm gonna shift to posing for a little bit and I'm gonna be quiet on some of these. Um, this is Ed, uh, whether it's temptation, whether it's angst, whether it's pain, I don't know, uh, but Ed is one of the, one, one model who is really comfortable in his skin and the way he expresses himself. I'd like you to meet Nick. Nick um, showed up. This is in our living room. And uh, Nick shows up with all sorts of clothes and a and very, very stylish guy. Uh, he also belongs to a tribe of punk. Uh, it's called SXE, which is straight punk, meaning no drugs, no promiscuous sex, no alcohol. But when you look at him and he's got these 
gauge earrings, his hair, these great eyes, piercings, tattoos. Um, and he shows up with somewhat conservative clothing. So I thought, well, let's do a conservative pose. And when you look at him and, and think about congruency and, and who are they as they represent, is this sort of what you imagine? Or is this? So Nick is very much into, uh, he, he is multiracial, he's into uh, equity. And in our discussion about that is what prompted this pose. His tattoos are beautiful. And one of the things about his body that's really interesting around this idea of congruence is the front of him is tattooed almost completely and the backside has no tattoos whatsoever. And it was really interesting to look at his skin, as his, at his canvas from the front, and then and it being it moved because it was so beautiful, and then to look at his non-inked backside and be moved. And I, I asked him, I said, you know, why, why isn't your backside uh, tattooed? And his comment was, I haven't found the right tattoo artist yet. And it's almost as if he's waiting to turn a page. What is the next congruency? What is the next evolution? What is the next identity? We don't know. He used to be in Philadelphia. He's now uh, in LA, comes back occasionally. So you've been seeing uh, individuals. I'm gonna move a little bit to some couples if my computer moves. If my there we go. If my computer moves, so this is a trans masculine couple. Uh, they express themselves in terms of their pronouns, their piercings, the clothing that you wear, uh, they that they wear, and the tattoos, as well. Again, we were doing poses, and when I finally just said, you know, be yourself. These are some of the images. One of the things that really struck me about this couple is they had thought so much about their identity in terms of sensualness, sexuality, um, and being congruent with who they were as individuals and as a couple. So if you're familiar with Gustav Klimt's Adam and Eve, um, this is a little bit of a rendering or a nod to that and how often art is represented between male and females and it's considered beautiful. And so what I wanted to do was take an idea of two men in similar types of poses um, and just being authentically who they, who they are and representing who they are, but in these very traditional and classic and well-known pieces, using those pieces as inspiration. Klimt also did a piece called Judith and the story of Judith, Judith was a concubine. She went into her captor's tent decapitated him, took his head, went back to her village and showed her village people that this feminine power had overcome the captor. And, and in the portrait, he's holding up, she is holding up the head next to her breasts and they're bare breasted, which at the time was shocking. And so again, what I wanted to do was to bring two men, similar pose. Uh, many people know the biblical story of Judith uh, and do a rendering of it as well. And I'm gonna wrap up a little bit with uh, just a few more images. The, the middle piece is, is a weeping Buddha, the story of weeping Buddha. It's actually a yogi for those that really know the difference, but anyway, it's called the weeping Buddha. Uh, he was a warrior, he left his hometown, he conquered many lands. There was an insurrection in his home village. He returned to his home village and he killed 
the main uh, opponent. And as he removed the mask of his opponent, he realized that he had just killed his son. And he collapsed into that pose in sorrow. And he's never moved since. And so when you see the sculpture of a weeping Buddha, the idea is to rub it and he will take your sorrow because his sorrow was so great. The two models on either side uh, are a couple and they had gone through uh, some challenges. And so I asked them if they'd be willing to pose with the weeping Buddha. Again, this idea of religious, spiritual beliefs and expression. So this uh, model has a huge tattoo on her back of Ganesh. So we instantly connected, if you remember the first image with Ganesh, uh, the model biting my ring. And she has converted to Islam. And so we've been going back and forth and wanting to do yet another shoot about how this religious conversion has affected her identity and what it means for her. So I, I put that in there just as, as a means to go back to some of the beginning of, of the opening, which is, you know, I feel like I've been doing, you know, this, the idea of this started when I was 10 years old and people are evolving and their bodies are changing and they're changing based on how they are identifying either religiously or spiritually, sexually or sensually and how connected they're becoming with their body. And the, the surprise for me is that, you know, here I am an old, almost old man. <laughs> And uh, that I vividly, if, if you missed the, the opening, I vividly remember being in the car of my parents saying, I'm going to go to the body shop on this rural road of North Carolina, and I'm going to have my body fixed. So the, the idea is just to continue uh, capturing images of people that have alignment with their spiritual beliefs, their physical beliefs, or their physical um, bodies in terms of sensuality and sexuality. And that's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That was awesome. I feel like I'm so familiar with your work. And then I just learned so much about you and your art. I loved it. That was fantastic, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to pause for one second here yeah, while I okay. load up another slideshow. Yeah. All right. Javi. Oh, or whoever. <laughs> All right, David, thank you for that presentation. Phoenix, without further ado, Phoenix, you're up next. Oh. <laughs> um, so, I am, um, I'm Phoenix Robles. Um, I'm a visual storyteller that really utilizes the sociological perspective when um, delving into my photographs. Uh, most of my work is done via street photography, which I really don't appreciate that name anymore. Um, I guess the way that I approach my photography is very much so in a fine art uh, perspective. Um, no two images and reasons are the same as to why I'm documenting um, a scenario. And so I really believe this shows in my work. Um, am I able to navigate this? Oh, no, I'll have to do it okay. for you. Yeah, yeah. So you just let me know when to go next. You can go to the next slide. So um, we can go through these. So these first few images um, really begin in my journey with street photography. Um, really early on, I did a lot of traveling and it was not succinct in the way that I wanted it to be. I knew that I was really using photography as a way to observe my outside um, environment as a Black queer uh, film woman, always feeling like I did not fit into a certain scenario or perspective in any kind of way. And so um, photography became my piece of something that gave me a voice silently. And these images were really 
me navigating until I found my voice in a way. Um, you can, um, so I have a background in social work uh, with a minor in sociology and psychology, but I've always been an artist. I am a multimedia artist. I use writing, specifically prose and acrylic photog um, painting, excuse me, along with my photography to develop this form of visual storytelling. And one of the things that really stands out to me in sociology is this sociological imagination. And if you're familiar with C. Wright Mills, he's an amazing sociologist. Can you please go back? It's um, it's on auto. Okay. So <laughs> there's this theory that says the sociological imagination enables us to grasp history um, and biography and the relations between the two within society. Now you can move forward. Um, my first series is Black Girl with the Blues. Um, and the series was really developed um, at a time where I was going into a master's degree in social work and sociology, um, simultaneously dealing with the loss of my father who was dying from cancer, who was also my abuser, um, while simultaneously dealing with the domestic violence relationship. All of these things were a culmination of this series, which I set, uh, shot on an Icon D7000 um, using a 35 millimeter lens. This story was told the day my father died. Um, I simultaneously had gotten beaten that morning. Mm. Um, and so I decided to utilize my camera to really um, delve into shadow work, my own personal shadow work. And so in sociology and psychology, we say that shadow work are those parts of yourself that you haven't really understood yet. Um, and this was my time where I wasn't understanding any parts of what was happening in my life. And so I allowed my camera to um, let me see what losing control looked like. So this was day one of that. That was the moment in which I had no idea who I was, hence the shadow, heavy shadowing on my face. Um, you know, not really facing the camera, but facing the camera. Um, I knew who I was, but not really inside. And so um, this was the process of me kind of falling apart. Um, this image is called drowning. For obvious reasons, I, uh, during this process, thank you. Um, my suicide attempts were many. Um, and again, I use black and white photography to kind of highlight the light in which was missing at the time. You can move forward, please. This photo is called emaciated. Um, so again, we're going through this process of what mental health looks like when you are deteriorating physically and mentally at the same time. Um, coping mechanisms. So all of the things that I knew as a professional social worker, as a professional psychologist, as a professional, you know, all of these things that I was growing into being, I started to relinquish what was normal. And I started relying on substances to get through my day-to-day -day basis. This is unseen. Um, this is probably a few months after my dad's death um, from cancer. I had uprooted myself to Puerto Rico and I lived there for a while. I kind of did a self-imposed um, artist fellowship. And to understand myself as I was going through these things, but I was a black woman living in a place where nobody really cared to listen to me. Um, and during this time, I developed relationships on a sociological perspective with other black Afro-Latina women there who were suffering through being unseen as well. Um, and in the area in which I lived in, there were so many femicides that happened that nobody cared to hear about. In the United States alone, 90% of the women that are murdered are murdered by lovers. And so 
people that they know. And these things are happening in front of their faces and predominantly black and brown women are suffering these things. And so at this portion of my journey and this project, the wig became a representation of someone else in who I had to become to survive in these instances. This photo is called Black and Blue. Um, as you can see now, the color in the series represents this completely different person. Um, this black girl with the blues um, physically. And um, these images were done immediately after I had been physically abused by a lover. And I chose to document that moment, not just as proof of these things happening, but the psychological impact that happens in the moment that nobody else gets to see. Um, and these are things on the back end that professionally you hear if you're lucky to have someone to come in, but to see it from a first person perspective, to be able to analyze, to be able to sit here and create community within that was very important within this series. Um, so from that series, I grew as a self-portraiture documentary photographer. A lot of my work deals with identity. Identity, I am a mother. Identity as a queer person. Identity as a Black person. Identity as a person who doesn't fit in any of these boxes and continues to grow. Um, so these series, from the top to the bottom, if you can go back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, from the top to the bottom, I am dealing with freedom within my person while still trying to understand myself. Um, and again, these images were shot on a Nikon D7000. Um, I used a lot of long exposure within that, um, utilizing dance and movement within myself and allowing myself to free flow. Um, the bottom is the bottom left is dealing with heartbreak after dealing with an abusive relationship. Is this fair to your body? How foreign this feels to your body, but still understanding that this isn't healthy for you. So it's trying to stand again. Um, I was trying to represent that um, and still this image of not seeing yourself right? Being cut off from the world and this blurred version of yourself as you're trying to grow within your person. The next images um, are from a series called Sexual Lies. Mm -hmm. And this deals with um, the role of a feminine body as a mother and that responsibility of it. Um, are you a tool or are you someone who chooses life? Um, these parts of you that are often um, said they are useful until they are not useful anymore. Um, and the images in the red are the passion for yourself. Um, and you all can't really see it, but I'll read uh, the middle one for you. I utilized um, digital art for this one utilizing um, mixed media with the lines and kind of tapped into this twilight zone feeling. And what it reads is, how many times have you silenced yourself for the comfort of others? How many times have you qualified the beauty of your body and beauty within natural attraction to your sexuality for the sake of being a lady, for those who were less than deserving for your complete womanhood? How many times have you blinded yourself to be able to see through the eyes of the blind? <laughs> so um, within this, I utilize my prose too. I often use my writings to pose questions, not only to myself in an open-ended way, but allowing the viewer to kind of dabble in their own perceptions of what they view as sexuality and freedom and how they have utilized the feminine body for their own good in a way. Um, and then I dive into religion. Uh, the top one is 1 Corinthians, I believe 6 through 20, 6 and 20. Um, I don't have these off the top of my head because I try not to remember hateful things, but um, 
it really has to do with how we see the body and where we draw the line in religion and how we interpret these sayings when applied to a woman, right? Um, when we are saying that the body is a temple and is supposed to be respected, but we do not respect these bodies that are created, what kind of line are we drawing and where does this sense of ethics come in within religion when it applies to other people? Um, the next uh, series is my latest series, Besides of a Revolution, and this is more street photography um, in a documentarian sense. I had the honor of being an organizer, um, and I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, and really being a part of something that was life-changing, documenting the uprisings from 2020 until still now, now. And I started in New York, what was something that was very small and, and well-intended um, just to tell the truth about what was happening from the inside out to something that became so surreal and uh, beyond myself. Um, and this image is to begin in the <laughs> home of Miss Micah, who sits in front of us. Um, they were a very intricate part of what was happening in New York in terms of organizing, but this was a representation of everything we had done in two years and what we felt about how we were being treated. This flag was very holy, full of holes, mm -hmm. full of lies, very uneven and abstract and um, not what it said it was represented, muddied, stained, bloodied. Um, you can move on. What I wanted to capture was, can you go back? Yeah, Thank you. What I wanted to capture initially was not only the civil uprisings that was happening, because the mainstream media will give you this perspective that these horrible people were just very angry and they were going around and destroying everything. And that was very untrue. From one instance grew these beautiful communities from the top to the bottom, you see the diversity, the roles in which people played. So these microcosms of society beginning to develop from something that was so very tragic. People who didn't normally have voices became loud and the forefront and the vanguard of a movement of so many different people, old, young, black, white, Asian. And one of the central portions of our movement was being able to document the Stonewall protest led by Queen Jean and Joella Rivera. And that was the mainstay, that was the home base. That wasn't just protesting, that was church. And not only did these people come from many different walks of life, but it changed the views of how we saw each other and gave respect. So it was a sociological experimentation within itself of how we develop communities. Um, you can move forward. This was when we went to the March on Washington, DC in 2020. Um, through NAN, uh, which was led by Reverend Isle Sharpton. Um, a lot of what you see here was the influxes of what was happening at that time, our run-ins with the police to protect Black women who were being beaten by proud boys. These are the things that you were not seeing. The protection that both masculine men and feminine men, these things did not matter. What mattered was protecting Black women in that moment. 
the unification that was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. This was Stonewall protest. This is our celebrations on every Thursday now. Sorry, we, it's okay, you can <laughs> stay there. <laughs> so um, this is where, you know, a lot of the activists across um, the United States of America, this was our center point in Washington, DC, and we were able to grow from there. Um, Stonewall protests every Thursday um, is where we met to have celebration, but also there was always an action that led afterwards, whether it was feeding um, our, our brothers and sisters outside or you know, having an action to support someone else. It was always unification, education, and then an action afterwards. You can move forward, please. Forward. Um, but I also wanted to highlight the darker times. And if you can just stay here for a moment. Um, these were also the moments where our roles came into play. Um, this day I called the MLK Day Melee and where we started at Brooklyn, um, the Barclay Center, if I'm not mistaken. And it was a coalition of some of the more larger organizations and also grassroots organizations that, uh, again, were at the forefront of many of the protests and actions that were being led across the country. Um, we marched over the Brooklyn Bridge, if I'm not mistaken, that day and was met by um, SRG and uh, the police, several police departments, and where we were simply having a celebration for Martin Luther King Day, um, it turned into one of the ugliest um, arrests. I believe we had 33 arrests that evening, many of which were caught on camera in acts of abuse, and um, just disrespectfulness to trans women by snatching their clothes off, snatching their wigs off. And, um, and so again, through this sociological imagination, you begin to understand what care looks like in a harmful world. The roles that people have to play when you are seeking utopia, but you are forced to act in an ugly way to achieve it. Um, you can move forward, please. Um, this was Brianna Taylor's birthday. So again, these influxes of sorrow and celebration and community and our roles in which we play um, within it all and identity and how we are, are learning to form healthy habits of love even within this chaos that we are living in. Um, and so the latter portion of this project, um, I had the honor of being able to go to Minnesota. And I chose to go during the trial of Derek Chauvin. I wanted to understand what was happening in Minnesota. And to give you a personal perspective, I have family from the Midwest and I have a cousin who was murdered by police officers there as well. And so my own relationship with these stories was very personal once I got there. And I traveled there with Chris Facey, who was a guest here as well, um, a wonderful mentor of mine but we traveled together and we experienced a hell of a ride. And that is the only way that I could describe it. Um, arriving there on the day that Dante Wright was murdered was something different. It was an element in the air that I had not seen besides uh, documenting the elections of Trump, very violent, very thick, very divided. 
Um, but what I did manage to capture was the expression of community that was not being um, shown there. How these communities were coping with the news and the violence. And I mean, directly across the street from an elementary school and in, in apartment buildings. This is a residential area with military presence. As soon as seven o'clock hits, a curfew comes on and the sound of warfare is what we were hearing, where we are literally running from, you know, rubber bullets and tear gas and all because the community wanted equity and justice for lives that, hey, George Floyd had just been murdered, but you just killed a kid the other day, right here. And you are across the street from a church, a school, and buildings with people who are poor. Um, and so this is a scene right next to each other. Imagine young people yelling at police and military with rifles pointed at them to get out of their neighborhoods with other people praying on their knees. That's what we were experiencing through the day. You can move forward. Um, and this is the end of it, but um, this was the George Floyd Memorial. And on the opposite end of all of this pain, the people created a way. At the George Floyd Memorial, there were people being fed, there were people being clothed. There were people learning. There were people teaching about abolition and what it means to live in a diverse community. They made it a safe haven. And they welcomed anybody that wanted to find out how to take this love, an indigenous love, back to their homes to begin to protect it against this violence that was coming in. And so all of these images were shot on a Rico GR3. <laughs> <laughs> this thing here. <laughs> also, I want to thank, I put it on the end, but I really do want to thank um, Minnesota. They, they are full of love. I learned so much about what it meant to be forgiving in your pain, actively forgiving, because being actively forgiving means that you can help to heal others. And I took this back to my community and I was able to create spaces of hope where we were very lost. So I thank Minnesota for being honoring us with their love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like we have a ton of incredible yeah. complimentary so comments for out. everyone. I haven't, Michael, have you sifted through for questions? No, I haven't seen any questions. No questions. <laughs> everyone just loves your work. <laughs> Lots of compliments. Lots of compliments. <laughs> Um, well, we are going to take a few questions. Um, we have about five minutes left, but we can run over a little if needed. Um, so if anyone at home has any questions for either of our artists, please type them into the chat box. Um, or anyone here in person, do you have any questions? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, hold on. Come on up. Oh, Abbott, you can. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Yeah, oh, turn the camera on. All the time that you're talking, I'm always thinking of all the people coming in front of the camera and trying to empower people. And when they say, when they go low, we go high. Yeah. And I, part of me understands it, but part of me, frankly, wants to question that. Mm -hmm. And I think you know where I'm from, coming from. 
So it's just a very open-ended question then. When people say that, how does that become real to you? When, a, when, when in reality, the brutality of what you're facing at the moment, doesn't it seem like going high when you're being bullied and hit? It's um, not real. <laughs> so I'll answer that for you. Because How's I, that for I, a first I question? I can't understand. Huh? Okay. First of all, I feel like you see me. Yeah. Um, photography is me taking the high road. Um, Phoenix is the artist. Let's just start there. I am a, a conduit of spirituality and translation, and that is taking the high road. I have a duty with this camera, and this camera is to preserve the truth of who we are being here, right? But I was born as Tiana, and Tiana came from a very revolutionary family. I like to fight. And I like to fight for the little people. And, and I have the scars to show for it. And I'm proud of these scars because it lets me know that I was not silent about what was wrong in any way, whether spiritually, whether physically, whether intellectually, I went to school because I want to be better than them. I am an artist because I am spiritually connected to be better than that. And I am a warrior physically because I knew being born in this body, I was gonna have a hell of a fight. So no, I don't like to play nice. Mm -hmm. I just present as very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so we did get a question typed in for Phoenix. Were you ever scared at any point you were working? Oh, yes. Um, it was my time in Washington, D.C. And, you know, we traveled into Richmond. Um, and this is a very personal story, but I will say that during that time, um, we got entrapped by Proud Boys and um, the police in Virginia. We were not a welcomed presence there as journalists, as independent journalists, um, and as activists. We had just um, covered the election where Trump said he won and blah, blah, blah. But um, we went over to cover what we thought was a protest. And I stupidly did something that photojournalists are not supposed to do and did not follow the lead on my own. I just trusted this information based off of who this person was and ended up going into a situation where we had KKK, we had Confederate people flicking their lights on with their shotguns and we were stranded in this place where I had no way out. I did not know how to get out and I'm with people who I came with. Um, and so I really did think that at best I was going to be jailed and just kept in a place where um, they're a commonwealth. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, and I'd be lucky if I got home. Um, so, and they can keep anything of mine and hit me with federal charges there. Um, so that was a very, very scary time, <laughs> truly indeed. Who asked that? <laughs> Let me tell you about her. That's my best friend. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was like, that sounds like something. I have a quick question. David, how do you find the models that you shoot with I'll approach a stranger um, if I see somebody and that I think look, just looks interesting and have a conversation. And sometimes it's Instagram. Sometimes it's a friend of a friend of a friend. Um, yeah, it's pretty. I find people that have interesting stories and then that starts the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. I have a question. Sure. I see you use a lot of color within your work. Um, what does color? What does color represent to you within your photography? Because I see a lot of symbolism within it as well. <laughs> yeah. So I, I appreciate that because I have just gladfully been schooled by your presentation and I appreciate your work and, and you. your stories very, very much. Um, yeah, so so similarly, you know, when I talk about congruency and look at identity and sexuality and, and sensuality, color, of course, same as all our senses, plays a lot with that. And similarly, when you look at the symbolism of color and or red of blood and blues and and what that represents in terms of history uh, for me it is an embellishment mm -hmm. it, it, it's part of the recipe um it's not the point mm -hmm. but it adds the flavor to to, to the image it gives me such renaissance -y mm. feel <laughs> a lot i appreciate that thank you that Any other questions in the chat? No more thank yous. No. I think this was a good pairing, though. So much. <laughs> I had no idea, right? <laughs> I, I love had no it. idea. <laughs> I loved it. I hate to say, but I right. know what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank yeah, both of you. Sounds like both of you guys motivate me a lot. Phoenix, Amazing. your work, David Tim, man. Amazing. I've known Phoenix for a while and the artist that she is, what it took for her to show those photos mm. from Minnesota. Like she's been telling me about a lot of these photos and I know she probably has like a terabyte full of photos <laughs> from when she went out there, but she's been telling me, she says, I, they haven't even seen this yet. They haven't even seen this. Before. So for you to present that, that means a lot. Well, I am so grateful Definitely. to both of you. Thank you for allowing me the platform. And also, I, I love your work. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna be talking, we're gonna be talking. I love your work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Same. Th thank you. I'll, I'll do it to Heather and Habib and Mike for just giving the opportunity. I've been coming to these. This is just such a great opportunity. And I know there are other artists in the, in the room who are going to be who you can tap into. Mm -hmm. um, but but thank you guys for doing this. It, it's It's great. Thank you for being here, <laughs> both of you. Awesome. Yeah. You all the courage. Yeah. yeah, the courage. Thank you for receiving it. <laughs> it's here for you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, our next one is November eighth, which is actually voting day. So, oh yeah, go vote and then come to the JPC come here. gallery. <laughs> Right. Keep a running happen. ticker under the screen. Yes. <laughs> Voting news. Voting news. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you all for being here. We will see you in a month. Yes, and thank you. Thank you all. Yep.